uh, our scripture is from the Gospel of John. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you may bear much fruit and become my disciples. The word of the Lord. This week I have spent a lot of time learning about grapevines. Now I know about tomatoes because I'm from South Georgia, right? But I don't know much about grapevines. It's been fascinating for me to learn about grapevines. I didn't realize how fragile a plant they are. Now, now keep in mind, Jesus is taking uh, the vine and the vineyard and the branches from the grapevine and using them as an analogy for discipleship. So we just have to keep all of this in mind. And I, I think about how sensitive these things are. I've, I've read stories about in California, they'll, they fly helicopters. There are helicopters of pilots who will fly over the vineyards to keep the temperature just right. That before you walk into the vineyard, if you are one who's going to prune back for the year, you have to soak your shoes in some type of a special bath so that that you don't bring anything into the soil in the vineyard. You have to wash your tools and your hands and everything. And I thought, man, that seems like a lot of work. No wonder wine is so expensive. I think about not only how, how fragile this plant is, that it needs all of this regular tending by the people who care for it. It's very, very time-consuming. There's a lot of heart and energy and dedication that you get up and you, you care for this vineyard like it's a, a living, breathing entity, which it is, but I mean more so than you would think of with just any kind of plant. And then I learned about pruning. Um, you know, I know with tomato plants, they call them, you, you sort of nip the sucker. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry, but it just helps you to produce bigger tomatoes on a tomato plant by, by removing these little branches that start to grow in between two branches. That's what you call it. You call it nipping the sucker. But in a, in a, in a vineyard in the winter, sometime between January and March, they go back and they... They, they cut back and prune uh, the, the wine, I mean, the, uh, the, the grape, what's it called, a bush, a tree, a plant, something. How about a grapevine? I'll just call it that. That's what Jesus called it. And as they come down, there's different ways to do it, but you basically only leave like one piece of new growth for the year down about this far. You prune it back. I even read one article, an expert from Oregon who said the biggest mistake that people who care for grapevines make is they don't trim it hard enough. They're, they're too careful with their trimming. They leave too much. They don't trim it back enough. All of this was fascinating to me as I was thinking about and living in this passage of Scripture this week where Jesus compares and talks about those of us who are followers, who are disciples, how we are called to be the branches and we are called to abide in the vine. Abiding in the vine is a really big deal. But that word is not really a word that we're familiar with anymore, abide. Seems like an old English word. But the word in the Greek, meno, uh, literally can mean a lot of things. As a matter of fact, this word is very important in the Gospel of John. John uses the word meno, abide, more than any other of the New Testament writers even combined. He really likes this word. And, and the word itself as a root means to stay or to remain or to continue or to endure or to be present. 
Abiding is about communion in the connection. It's not just to be somewhere. It's to be somewhere and be planted somewhere, to be deeply connected somewhere. So in the Gospel of John, when it talks about Jesus was living somewhere or staying, they they would come and say, where are you abiding? With Jesus, the word meno is always used because with Jesus, it wasn't just where you're staying, where you're spending the night. Whenever Jesus is brought into this situation, it's always... Where, Jesus, are you rooted and where can we we be rooted with you in constant communion? And so this idea of abiding is really this sense of, of being totally present at a level of communion and commitment and staying that is far beyond just visiting somewhere for a while. In John's gospel, Mano points to this union and this oneness in which two parties exist and function as one, an ongoing living union. That's what abiding means. That's what John means when he uses this word. Two who are now connected such a deep way that they exist now almost as one new entity. Last night, I stood right up here. And was able and blessed to officiate the wedding for Travis Miles and Grace Palmer. Grace grew up here at Chapelwood. They both recently graduated from Baylor. Good school, I hear. Yeah, medical school. They're, they're uh, medical school graduates. They both got their residency here in Houston. She's going to be a radiologist. He's going to be a surgeon. Great couple. I was so moved because I do a lot of weddings. Now, this past year, it's been a little slower, as you can imagine. I do a lot of weddings. But I'm going to tell you something. Last night, I was struck. Because as I had them repeat the vows, and as they exchanged the rings and they said the words to each other, I watched how they looked at each other. And I'm telling you, there was something transcendent there. And I shared at the end, I said, I hope that all of us can find someone in our life at some point who will look at us like Grace looks at Travis and like Travis looks at Grace. I mean, he was, he was sharing these vows with her and she was just beheld in that moment by him. There was nothing I could say or do that could take her away from that trance. And I thought about that. I said in, in, the, in the little sharing of the message, I said, I know you two are not going to be at church tomorrow, I, I'm assuming. Uh, which is okay. I said, but I've been working on this sermon this week about abiding and this word meno and this word to be present, to be one, where two come and connect and, and, are, and are born together to become something greater than themselves. There's a oneness, there's a union about it. And I said, all I could think about was you two this week as you get ready to share your vows in front of us all. Meno. To be together. You know, even uh, Eugene Peterson, who translated the Bible, an actual direct translation from the original Greek, but he uses more contemporary language. And he translates this passage in verse 4 and 5 this way. He says, live in me. He doesn't use the word abide, but here again, it's the same faithful translation from the word meno. Live in me. Make your home in me. Just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only after being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. This is how Jesus envisions the ongoing post-resurrection relationship with his disciples. This is how Jesus envisions the ongoing post-resurrection relationship of us who are Christian followers of Christ to abide in the vine as we are rooted, stayed, connected in communion, in oneness. Because without that, we cannot bear fruit. This is not a passive relationship. Abiding, main though, is not a passive relationship where God just exists in your life somewhere out there on the shelf and you pull it down from time to time. Jesus is fully committed to abiding and being present in you at all times. And so we can't engage in this in a passive way. This is a very active, proactive relationship 
that we are called to have with God if we are to produce fruit and to be the kind of disciples that Jesus calls us to be. And that leads to the second aspect that Jesus lifts up. He says that the vine grower is really focused on the fruitfulness of the, of the vineyard. That makes complete and perfect sense. When I used to have a tomato garden in Georgia, I mean, it was very important for me to go out and check on this thing, to cultivate it and to nurture it. I mean, I wasn't just out there to grow tomato plants that didn't make tomatoes. And I also was not out there to grow tomato plants that made tomatoes that the squirrels and the birds would take from me. We had some problems with that. I got a little trick, by the way. It, it, you just use pantyhose. I'll tell you that another time. This, this, uh, what he says, though, is that there's going to be uh, this way that, that the vine grower, God, will prune and or cut off branches that are fruitless. Or, well, let me, let me say it this way. He will cut off the branches that are fruitless, that are disconnected from the vine, that do not produce fruit. But he will also prune the branches that do produce fruit so that they can produce even more fruit. Now, one of the things I've learned through the years is that when you read the commentaries, the, the, the scholars and people who write a lot of commentaries, a lot of them like to avoid the old concept of cutting things off and casting them into the fire, especially Methodists. <laughs> We're not really into the, the hellfire and brimstone kind of preaching. But I think it's really important to get this uh, in the passage the way that Jesus means it. Because this word pruning, uh, actually the root of the word Greek here, it, pruning does mean to sort of remove. It also literally means is to cleanse or to purify. So to prune something is to cleanse, to purify it, to make it more productive, to make it better. If you're a parent, you know this is what we do with our kids, Right? Sometimes you have to engage in discipline. Sometimes you have to say or do or draw boundaries for things that our children can't do. Sometimes you have to make them do more of something so that they become better at it. What are we doing as parents, right? We are cleansing and purifying, helping our children to grow. I know is now having one that's, been, that's married and moved out and one that's in college is that there comes this season, right? You've done all that you can do up until a point. And now you're no longer sort of the parent that's over the child. You're sort of a peer. You're there as a friend. But when your children are coming up, you know that you're engaged in the constant aspect of pruning. Parents get this. Parents get this. Sometimes we have to do hard things or say hard things in order for our children to grow. So this whole concept of pruning or removing is very important in John 15. Listen what he says. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it to, so that it can bear more fruit. This word, remove, prune, purify, cleanse, they all have the same root. The branches are in the process of being cleansed, of being purified. This is what pruning means. Now think about the disciples. Think about the disciples who have already been walking with Jesus for some time. This is the farewell discourse now that we're reading out of. So we're at about three years that the disciples had been walking with Jesus. And think about what they've already done. Think about what they've already produced as fruit in their lives. But think about how much farther they have to go, the things they've not been confronted with yet. So think about Jesus' words, how they've integrated some of them. He's told them that you've got to take up your cross and follow me. You've got to die to self. You've got to lose your life in order to find your life. And they get it. They've tried, but they don't even really know what all of this means yet. They've had to submit to the pruner's knife already to cut away certain goals and ambitions they had in their lives. Peter had to walk away from his nets. Uh, Andrew and, and John and James. There were so many things they've had to give up to walk away from their families to follow Jesus and engage in this ministry. So many things they've already been pruned or cleansed or grown in. They had to sacrifice all of these things. They had to lay aside their own personal desires so that they could walk alongside Jesus. They have borne fruit, but they're going to have to be pruned to produce even more. And we'll see this after Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. We see that the disciples in their lives, for the rest of their lives, are producing great fruit 
as the gospel is spread all around the world, and yet we see some great pruning going on, some cleansing and some purifying in their own lives. Very difficult situations that they had to go through, and this is what happens for us. Now, these words are difficult to hear. Um, if we were really honest and we were going to take a survey, I don't think there's too many people in here who really look forward to being pruned, Right? or being cleansed, or purified, or being cut back to produce more fruit. I mean, I, I'm a pastor, and I don't look forward to that. And yet, for all of us, we have to remember that as harsh as it might sound, as difficult as it might seem in our own life, Jesus says that the vine grower, God, will remove or cut away the branches that are fruitless. What does it mean to be fruitless? You think about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of these aspects that we are supposed to live. You don't see and sense so much of that from Christians these days. The fruit seems diseased or even not even present sometimes. It's almost like, as as Jesus is saying here, it's like if, if these branches are not interested in producing the fruit, the love, the grace, the embodiment of mercy, to live in the way that Jesus told us to live. Just as I read this morning in the passage of 1512, John 1512, right after this, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. The one central commandment, the greatest commandment, to love God and to love neighbor as yourself. If we can't get these, Jesus is saying, the vine grower will look at the the field and see there are fruitless branches. Not interested in producing the kind of fruit that the vine grower is tasked with producing. That God is tasked with producing in God's vineyard. Because sometimes those branches lose sight of their function. You and I forget sometimes that we are called to bear this kind of fruit. And sometimes, sometimes... Sometimes we've planted, as branches, we've planted our roots in other vines. Not in the vine of Jesus, but in other vines, in ideologies, secularism, Christian secularism that even exists, in in philosophies and ideologies and partisan beliefs that that shape us and tear us apart. And and we claim that there's somehow that they're a part of, of being abiding in the vine. And yet when you look at the fruit that come out, look at the fruit. And you can tell whether or not you are actually connected to the vine that is Jesus or not. And so God said, you don't have to worry about it. This is what I love about this. I don't have to be the one to prune you. (laughs) And you don't have to be the one to prune me. There are a lot of church members think they need to prune me. Appreciate it, love it, uh, and they'll be glad to tell me that. It's not my job to prune or to cleanse or to cut back. That's God's work. It's the vine grower's work. My job is to be faithful and to abide in the vine that is Jesus. My job is to make sure that the fruit that I am in producing is in alignment with the fruit that the vine grower wants to produce in that field. So we got to be careful. Are we ourselves giving ourselves to producing fruit that's self-serving in our lives? Have we given ourselves and been distracted by our own self-interest, by powers and principalities that really are not eternal. So even if we are producing the wrong fruit or not producing fruit, we will be cut back. We will be disconnected. I've seen this happen. It's not so much, uh, what I see is people are disconnected. It happens. It's just a consequence of bearing the kind of fruit that is not God's fruit. I've seen more people walk away from the church this past year than I've ever seen in my 30 years of ministry. All sorts of reasons. But I have been hard-pressed to find the reasons to be about the things that are rooted in Scripture and more about things that are going on in the world and people don't like that the church doesn't agree or doesn't come down or doesn't say things or is not activist enough or this or whatever else. And the church is more focused on teaching the scripture, teaching the ways of God and the ways of living like Jesus. And some people want the church to be other things. Now, that doesn't mean we we don't speak into issues, but it does also mean that we are abiding in the vine so that we produce the fruit that the vine grower wants us to produce. 
But even then, and this is the hard part, even for those of us who are abiding, who are connected and rooted in the vine of Jesus, even those of us who are producing the kind of fruit that the vine grower wants us to produce, we are doing it, all of it in the face of great adversity to make sure that that kindness and that gentleness and that lovingness and that self-control and that patience and that peace and the embodiment of who Jesus is, is coming out of us. We're doing that. Even those of us who are faithful in that, we will also be pruned. We will be pruned. We will be pruned so that we can produce more fruit. Another thing I learned about grapevines, you have to prune them every year, whether you like it or not. It's not like one year you go, you know, well, last year was a great crop. So I think I won't prune them this year and we'll just see what happens. It doesn't work that way. They have to be pruned every year. The matter of cutting away or pruning the grapevines is closely tied to the abiding this is what's really important in this passage. These two things are not separate. Branches cannot go it alone. Branches that go it alone are of no use in the vineyard. Those are self-reliant branches. They wither, they die, they don't draw life from the true vine. I can tell you that, that abiding the vine means that if you are abiding, you will be pruned. And that is not a pleasant experience. It's not a pleasant experience to be pruned be grafted into Jesus and draw from that vine, you can find greater good, but you're also going to find that all of the powers and the principalities, things that, you're, that you want to be drawn to will be tested. I'll say this past year, I have noticed more, I, I guess I've always known that God prunes you in your life, right? And this past year, it's become more real to me and more relevant. I've noticed in my own life two aspects of this passage of Scripture coming to light. There have been some places where I have allowed myself over this past year to be grafted into a vine that was not the vine Jesus wanted me to be connected to. It wasn't the vine of Jesus. Just like many of you, I got caught up in some stuff and got mad about things and motivated by things and felt like he needed to say things about things that were rooted in stuff that was all over the map. And I found that it led to fruit that was not really the fruit God wanted me to bear. And I got cut back on some of that. I also found this past year that there were some places and spaces where I was really trying to be as faithful as possible, very intentional in my own spiritual walk with God to be tied into that vine more than ever and to resist, to even stand up against different types of fruit or different types of vines to be called to, different types of self-interest, different types of agendas. And I found that even then that great fruit was being produced and I was still being pruned and I didn't like that too much. But it brought me back to this passage of Scripture. And it makes me think about today that if your only agenda as a Christian is to live life that's just always kind of easy, the way you want it, never be tested, to never be pruned, and I'm telling you, you're not going to ever be really connected to the vine and operating in the vine grower's field. Because we will be pruned. I've seen this past year a lot of us be pruned. I have seen some people in this past year be cut back because they're not connected to the vine. They have disconnected themselves. Some people have just left church. I, I've seen more people leave their churches because of their political parties this year, but I have not seen one person leave their political party because of their church. It tells you something about our priorities. Someone else said recently that politics has become the new religion of America. And social media has become our new family. We got to really discern what are we tied and grafted into. Are we abiding in the vine that is Jesus? And if we are, we need to know that the vine grower will be managing that field. Our job is to be faithful, to abide to operate in a sense of oneness and communion and to bear the fruit, to bear the fruit that is borne out and tested out by Scripture. 
And if we do that, even if we're faithful, we'll still be pruned. Just like grapes, we are some of the most fragile plants in the world. We require much care and tending by God. God the vine grower. If we can abide in that union and oneness in Jesus, we will be pruned. But I promise you this, the resulting fruit will change the world. It will change our country. And it will be the kind of light and life that will draw people in our neighborhoods and in our land who have fallen away for church or don't know church or less connected in spirituality or religion than ever before. The reason they are is because they look at institutional church and they say, there's nothing there for me. There's nothing real. There's nothing deep. There's nothing living. There's nothing abiding about that. It's just maintenance and religion and, and institutionalism. I don't want to be a part of that. So I understand why the rest of the world doesn't. But I can tell you, I'm hopeful for the future because I believe in our country, the mission field is more ripe than ever before for churches that will abide in the true vine and produce the fruit that the vine grower calls us to produce. Let's pray. Lord, as we come together on this day and on every day, I pray, I pray that you would open our hearts and our lives to receive this message, this word from your word. And to hear once again what it means to abide in the vine. We are very fragile plants, all of us. We know that. Uh, we know that it can be difficult for us to be cut back or to be pruned. But I pray that today you would call us to be more, more conscious, more self-aware, more grounded in what it is that we are grafted into. What it is that is the vine we are deeply connected to. And I hope and pray that we will learn and discern that you are the vine. God is the vine dresser and that we are the branches who are called to produce fruit. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.